So given a basic knowledge of ZigBee and its architecture, let's start to talk a little bit about the individual layers of the ZigBee stack. So at the lowest level, you have the radio, which is your physical layer, and above that is the medium access control, or the MAC layer. So the MAC layer in ZigBee is based on 802.15.4, the IEEE standard. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what's significant there. So 802.15.4 is designed for low power, low data rate networks um, with a low cost objective in mind. So these are generally referred to as PANs, or personal area networks. And the idea here is that these would be low to moderate range kinds of application designs. Uh, but amplification is also possible with these things. You can get them up to, let's say, roughly uh, plus 20 dBm output power in most countries. Uh, in Europe, they're regulated a little bit lower, more like plus 10 dBm. But in general, that's enough to get you anywhere from, uh, let's say, a kilometer out to two to three kilometers, depending on what your, what your link budget looks like, what kind of amplification you have, what kind of antenna, and so on. So as far as data rates that you're getting with these things, when we say low data rates here, we're talking about, let's say, fast modem speeds. So even though the low, even though the raw bit rate here is, is 250 kilobits per second uh, using the 2.4 gigahertz direct sequence spread spectrum phi, or DSSS, the effective bit rate that you're going to see in a real protocol laid on top of that is actually going to be let's say maybe only about a quarter or a fifth of that. So more like, say, a 56 kilobaud modem would be a good expectation for what the end application is going gonna, is gonna to look for in terms of throughput on top of this. Anywhere from 50 to 70 kilobits per second on a single hop link, of course. Once you put in multi-hop effects, things are going to take a little bit longer to propagate, understandably. So the 802.15.4 standard provides for the ability to have multiple networks or multiple PANs on the same channel. And so therefore, you need some way to avoid having the packets collide over the air. So because the radio can only really tune in effectively to one packet at a time, you want to make sure that you can avoid having packet collisions. And so 802.15.4 implements a mode called CSMACA, Carrier Sense Multiple Access Collision Avoidance. And this collision avoidance here is done using CCA, or Clear Channel Assessments, meaning before we transmit, we're going to look and see if the airwaves are clear in our general area, if there's a low noise floor, let's say. And if we have clear air, then we're going to go ahead and transmit. So if we don't have clear air, what we're going to do is back off some random amount of time, some amount of milliseconds, jittered plus or minus a few other, a few extra milliseconds. And so that's going to give us some kind of random period where the nodes aren't all trying to transmit at the same time. So even if you have some kind of network-wide event that's going to cause all of the nodes to respond in general at the same time, it, at the specific level, the nodes are going to be staggered because of these random backoffs. So they're going to make sure that even if they all detect the same period of silence, they're not going to all begin to transmit immediately. So if you get clear air, you back off a little bit and transmit. If you don't get clear air, you back off a, s a number of back off periods in several milliseconds before transmitting. So effectively that allows multiple nodes to stagger their transmissions so that at some point they can find a small space of clear air. And so even though the bit rate is somewhat low, the packets are also fairly small. They're a 128 byte maximum packet format, including a 16 bit CRC or checksum. So given that the packets are small, the bit rate is generally sufficient enough that these packets can get out fairly well, even if the network's quite busy on that channel. Now, in terms of knowing if your packet made it there or not, because there's this issue of having a wireless network, uh, you need this way to acknowledge the packets. So at the link level, at 802.15.4, in other words, over a single hop, a unicast transmission, meaning one source and one destination, is going to have a MAC layer acknowledgement, a link level acknowledgement. And so that means that on, on a multi-hop transmission, every hop is going to get individually acknowledged here. So multi-hop protocols on top of 802.15.4 802, would have 
an individual transmission, a unicast, a unicast transmission that is, and then a MACAC corresponding to that to show that that individual relay was successful or not. So essentially the node is going to try to transmit. If it gets clear error, it's going to wait a couple milliseconds, go ahead and transmit, which is going to take a, few, a couple more milliseconds, wait for that MAC acknowledgement, and if it doesn't get that, it's going to continue to retry. So this is going to ensure some level of redundancy. Effectively, the device is going to try four or five times to get the same packet across a single hop until it gets that MAC acknowledgement from the other party. And in fact, in the Embrusinet stack, we even go a bit further, adding additional MAC retries, so that even though the additional, e even though the original MAC retries occur very quickly. Uh, upon not receiving the MAC acknowledgement, the Embrazinet stack will wait a little bit longer and try again with four or five MAC layer attempts. So we found in our experience that this is generally better than waiting for an end-to-end -end retry mechanism to kick in, which could be a number of seconds later. So if you're observing Embrazinet traffic, what you're going to see is that uh, in a bad connectivity scenario, there's going to be a burst of four or five MAC layer transmissions, and if the MAC act still hasn't arrived, then uh, after, say, 10 or 12 milliseconds later, you're going to see another flurry of a few MAC unicast retries, and then if there's still no MAC act, there's another set of retries there, and then if that doesn't work, then the individual end-to-end -end attempt is considered a failure, and then it's up to the higher level protocol to decide if it's supposed to retry or not. So we'll address that when we come to the higher levels. But effectively, at the MAC layer, there's a number of individual transmissions all predicated on whether or not we've received this MAC layer acknowledgement. In regard to available frequencies on 802.15.4, the specification allows for a few different bands depending on the different frequency zones. So 2.4 gigahertz is the most common because it's globally unlicensed, meaning you don't need any special permission to use that channel allocation. You just need to go through basic compliance testing with FCC or CE or ETSI or whatever your regional uh, compliance testing facility is. So in the 2.4 gigahertz band, you have 16 channels running from a center frequency of 2.405 gigahertz all the way up to 2.480 gigahertz. There's also some sub gigahertz bands at 915 and 868 megahertz, but because there are fewer channels and the bandwidth is substantially lower by a factor of say 8 to 10, these kinds of frequency areas aren't generally used. Uh, except in some rare cases in Asia. So there aren't too many offerings out there that support these lower frequencies. And so Ember, as a company, has chosen to focus mainly on the 2.4 gigahertz offerings. So at the physical layer, the uh, range, as we said, can be roughly two kilometers line of sight um, with a fair amount of ampli amplification on it. And that's still within legal limits of most areas. Europe. And so because of all the channels, um, you have robust communications such that you can avoid interference by making sure to pick channels that are not terribly noisy. Now, if you do pick a channel and, and it does become noisy, Zigbee has at a higher level what they call frequency agility so that some network manager can move the network to a different channel. The other advantage to the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum is that it's available globally, which means you have a wide range of install base for your product. So a common question that we get is, what about Wi-Fi? What about 802.11 IEEE? So 802.11b, which is the most prominent kind of Wi-Fi traffic that you generally find uh, and, and is generally the most... Um, so 802.11b, which is the most prominent in the, in the same um, frequency range as where the Zigbee stuff is, where the 802.15.4 stuff is, um, uses a channel selection uh, shown in these graphs. Now, even though there's actually a separate range of channels for um, between Europe and North America, generally in our experience what we found is that, the, is that the majority of networks are deployed on the North American channels, even in Europe, just because most vendors tend to ship with the default settings for North America, uh, because that's what Cisco, for example, is using, and most devices tend not to shy away from that norm. So even a lot of the European devices tend to use um, the North American channel mappings for Wi-Fi. 
And so, in either case, um, what Zigbee's tried to do is um, is try to avoid any of those channels that overlap with Wi-Fi. So even though um, even though it does work fairly well having a Zigbee network on top of a Wi-Fi network, and we have plenty of customers that are doing that and coexisting happily even in the same box with a Wi-Fi transmitter, the Zigbee Alliance has said, okay, for official profiles, we want to just allay the fears of anyone who's concerned about this interference, and so we're just going to have um, Zigbee network, these official profiles set up networks on channels that are in between the Wi-Fi sets. So, as you can see here, there's a couple of gaps in the spectrum, and those are the places on the edges of the band where uh, Zigbee networks from the official profiles are likely to form. Now, if you're doing your own network selection um, or your own your own closed network scenario that doesn't rely on uh, standard profile interoperability, then you're welcome to form your network wherever you like uh, among these 16 channels. One thing to keep in mind here is that on the high end, channel 26 and even to some extent channel 25 are very close to the edge of the band, and there's a tightly regulated band outside of this outside of this area. So if you do happen to choose the highest channels, be aware that you're generally going to have to limit your output power on those channels to satisfy FCC requirements because some of the signal energy will bleed outside of the spectrum and into these uh, tightly regulated bands that your radio is not supposed to be in. So for that reason, um, a lot of device manufacturers will actually tend to avoid channel 26 in their in their software implementations, um, or otherwise somehow artificially limit the output power on those channels to prevent any kind of RF compliance issues. This is particularly important if you have strong amplification. The more amplification you have, the more energy is going to bleed outside the spectrum, so it's likely that in addition to channel 26, you may also need to apply some sort of filtering uh, on channel 25 as well, or, or power limitation to get it to satisfy that criteria. As far as making coexistence possible between 802.15.4 networks and either other 15.4 networks or existing IEEE networks like 802.11 or uh, Zigbee or Bluetooth, things of that nature, there are because there are 16 channels and because most of the other networks out there are going to be standards-based, these things are designed to coexist peacefully. And in the case of 802.15.4, because there is a collision avoidance mechanism with CCA that helps reduce packet collisions and therefore corrupted or lost traffic, you have a better chance of getting your packets through even when there's a fair amount of interference in the area. Beyond that, when the packets do fail to get across, there are back-offs, there are acknowledgments at various layers, there are retries, not just at the MAC layer, but also at the layers above that as well. Now, one area we get concerns about from customers occasionally is this emerging 802.11n standard that's coming up. Now, this does use some of the same channels as 802.11b and g in terms of the frequency usage, and so to that regard, it means that there will still be these intermediate spaces between Wi-Fi channels that Zigbee channels will be able to participate in that frequency without worrying about interference. Now, there is the possibility of channel bonding in 802.11 where you use two adjacent channels and kind of stretch your bandwidth across them, but that's generally something that's only done in the 5 gigahertz range, not the 2.5 gigahertz range. So it's not typically something you'd have to worry about as a, as a general source of interference for a Zigbee network. And keep in mind that because Ember has had many customers deploying thousands or millions of these devices in the field, we have a good sense that the coexistence here is viable in real-world scenarios. We've had customers do white papers on them, and if you contact Ember Support, we can refer you to various white papers of that sort that discuss coexistence between 802.15.4 networks or Zigbee networks specifically and other kinds of networks in the 2.4 gigahertz area. So now you have a good sense of the Mac and Phi. I'm Matt Dibb, and I hope you learned something.